So uh, good morning and, and welcome to our Sunday worship here at Blockhouse Bay Baptist Church. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, can you just, happy to be here. Great. Can you just tell us who you are and your connection to Blockhouse Bay? Well, actually, Carrie and New Zealand Baptist Churches. Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Michael Rhodes, and I'm right now in Memphis, Tennessee, where I've been living for a while. Uh, but somewhere during the last year and a half of COVID and all that, uh, I became Cary Baptist College's uh, Old Testament lecturer. So right now I'm teaching classes at Cary and their graduate program and undergraduate and certificate programs, uh, primarily in the area of Old Testament. But I'm doing that from here in Memphis until COVID allows us to make the shift uh, to, to move to New Zealand. So that's how I've gotten connected with Blockhouse and, and Baptists in New Zealand. Great. And uh, well, I'd love to, well, I will ask more questions about that later, perhaps. So part of the reason I'm asking you questions is, yeah, because you are connected to the Cary and to New Zealand Baptists, but also that you're an Old Testament scholar. Um, so as a Christian, as a, as a scholar, uh, how do you approach scripture in general? Why should I want to talk with you about how we're reading the Bible? Um, and just like, how do you balance in a way those two or balance or, or meld those two things together being a scholar and a christian yeah well i think as a christian scholar of the bible i see myself as standing in this long tradition that sees scripture as reliable and authoritative sort of the dependable guide for our lives and for how we think about god and how we think about ourselves and we think about our world so um, I come to scripture with sort of a, a posture of trust that God speaks in scripture and, and we submit to what God says to us in his word. Um, but as a scholar dealing with the way that God speaks in these ancient texts, which were written uh, in a world very similar to ours in some ways, and then also very different from ours in other ways, and, and with, which they took all sorts of things for granted that we don't know anything about. Um, I also want to recognize that there's a distance between the text as reliable and authoritative and our interpretation of that text. And so I'm interested in how often um, these texts might be doing something quite different than what we imagine them to be doing, uh, because we sort of bring with us a lot of baggage uh, to them. So I'm, I'm really interested in understanding how these texts might speak um, differently when we hear them sort of within their ancient context and within the context of the Bible as a whole. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I'm, I approach approach the text. And I'm also very, e even though I have, you know, what you might call a very high view of scripture, I'm really happy to learn from people who have different perspectives because I think um, God speaks this word to us. And we hear it best in community and, and even listening with, with those who, with whom we may have disagreements. Sure. So actually you, you align really closely. Well, you align with our statement of faith in terms of the Bible being an authoritative word on faith and life and, and practice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably why Carrie you know, pulled you on, hold to the same, same things that the Baptist churches <laughs> here do, which is great. Um, and that's the way that we've been approaching uh, Genesis as well, which is, one of the major reasons why I wanted to, to get in contact with you and to, to talk more about you, because I think Genesis is one of these interesting books that has so much to say, and yet mm -hmm. uh, it creates all sorts of difficulty in the way that we read and, and understand each other as we read in community. Mm -hmm. So um, as we're in this series of Genesis, I wanted to get somebody else's opinion, somebody else's outside perspective to help us uh, in a way, kind of see, okay, am I taking the church all in the wrong direction or really how scholars discussing this and thinking about it? So um, I'm just wondering, you know, when you read Genesis 1 through 11, uh, in particular, do you read that differently? Uh, when you say, you know, we, we may have baggage, do you read that differently from the rest of the gen of rest of Genesis as well as the Old Testament? And if so, can you tell me, like, what is it that leads you to read it a bit different? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I do tend to read Genesis 1 through 11 a little bit differently um, than Genesis 12 um, to the end of the book. Uh, and I, I, I want to be really clear, that's not because Genesis 1 through 11 tells us surprising things that occurred. Because <laughs> all of scripture tells us surprising things that mm. occurred. You know, it's, it's difficult for many modern people to believe that 
our Lord raised Jesus from the dead, which of right. course is at the center of our faith. And Paul says, if you take that bit out, you got nothing. You yeah, know, if you spiritualize right. that bit, the whole thing falls apart. So I don't read Genesis 1 through 11 uh, differently because, because it tells us surprising um, what we might call miraculous things about God in the world. And, yeah. and also, it's not because I don't think that God couldn't have um, created the world exactly like it sounds like he did in Genesis mm. 1 when people ask, like, could God have created the world in seven little days or whatever? I'm, I'm quite fine to say that he could have and, and may well have done so. Um, but I think that there's evidence both within the text itself and with what we know about the ancient Near East, that, that Genesis 1 through 11 may want to be read differently. For one thing, the text itself, there are places where a literal reading doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, you know, we have light. We have days before we have the sun. Uh, so how are we marking days? See, some people talk about 24-hour days. Well, you can't have a 24 hour day as we understand it without a solar system. And you don't get that till midway through, even the way that Genesis one and Genesis two, when you read them right next to each other, don't seem to line up flawlessly as historical consecutive histories, the way we talk about history. Um, so there's some things within the text. And then when you read Genesis one very carefully, it seems to me that there's some really interesting literary structural things going on. So you get, you know, this very common thing that scholars will point out, you get God seeming to create realms and then rulers. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there seems to be some real literary artistry that's going on yeah. in, in those texts. And so, the, or, or when you get to the other end, 11 and 12, or excuse me, 10 and 11, chapters 10, where you have the table, of, the so-called table of nations, where uh, Genesis is listing out all these different groups of people and they're spreading out all over the place and they're speaking different languages and, and, and diversifying. And then in 11, there's this story about an, a time when apparently there was only one, only one language and only, and people were all gathered together. That seems to be out of sequence historically, at least, yeah. if nothing else. So there's some internal clues, uh, but there's also this dynamic that when we um, know a little bit more about the ancient Near Eastern context, uh, there are a number of stories in Genesis 1 through 11 that show up elsewhere in the ancient Near East, right? So lots of cultures actually have a story of a giant cataclysmic flood. And we know those stories are older than uh, the story that we have in Genesis. And lots of cultures told stories about the creation of the world, right? And so we know that that uh, sometimes scholars will talk about that, that suggesting that the stories that we have are polemical the mm -hmm. idea being like, it's it's different. Um, I don't know if you guys have the musical. I've heard about the musical Wicked, you know, but it's it's basically riffing on the Wizard of Oz, you know. So so we know the story of Wizard of Oz, and then here it comes over kind of like ooh, Wizard of Oz with a twist. Yeah. And so if you're in an environment where everyone telling stories about a cataclysmic flood, for instance, and then the Bible comes along with sort of the Bible does the cataclysmic flood story that might lead you to believe that, that part of what's going on is, is the Bible is making some specific claims related, not just to what happened, but to what those other cultures are saying. So I think that when you read the Bible and its environment, there are also some reasons to say maybe scripture is doing something a little bit different here than say when you get to Abraham, where this feels like pretty straightforwardly a story about a human family out of which emerges the people of God. That feels like a different sort of story to the kinds of stories we find in the first 11 chapters. So in regards to that, I know when you have those clues inside the text and you have clues outside the text that say, read it a little bit differently. Um, yeah, how do people kind of categorize a little bit of that genre or uh, yeah, put those two pieces together to say, we still read this and say, this is God speaking to us. This is still authoritative for faith and life. Um, like, are you saying that there's different literature that can speak to us for God? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Like um, it's all true, you know, mm -hmm. but there's different ways of telling truth we know this because like Jesus tells parables, which are true and important. Mm -hmm. In fact, like crucially important, like yep. his ministry depends on them being true. 
but they're not true as historical narratives, right? And even the way the ancients told historical narratives isn't always the way we think about historical narratives. For instance, in our newspapers, we tend to draw a distinction between like the facts and the editorial column. Yeah. I'm not sure anybody in the in the ancient Near East uh, thought that, that you were just doing the facts. I think they always knew you were getting the editorial column, right? This is sure. a a a divine perspective on what happens. You know, yeah. this is the right perspective on the events. So even the language of historical narrative might give the wrong impression. I don't think that they were ever just telling us a series of events for the heck of it. They're always trying to make a case and a point about God. Um, but I think with Genesis 1 through 11, you have possibly something even different where you have these kind of um, pre-historical, if you like, stories about that, that give us truths, theological truths about about what who's in charge, where we came from, what the world is like. Um, but but they may be working more poetically, more figuratively than other parts of scripture. So in a way though, you're saying that, that the people of Israel who are hearing this for the first time might've had different expectations uh, in what they heard or what they communicated to get at truth in the grand yes. scale in terms of what they didn't know, what they weren't there for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, again, taking the idea of the flood, like if you're well aware that, that there are a bunch of all the people around you have an account of a flood and then you hear our flood story, that story is going to be answering different questions for you than if this is the first time you're hearing about a flood, right? Because you're hearing that story in the context of all these other stories and the similarities and differences are going to really ring for you and maybe be a large part of the point. Um, and I don't know if I can give some examples there. Can I give some sure, examples? Yeah, of, do. Like, yeah that'd be helpful. I mean, uh, like in some of the flood stories, uh, the, the gods are just bothered by the noise, you know, and one of the gods kind of has to rescue the hero sort of out from under the other gods. <laughs> That's a very different story than God saying, I've created this good world. I'm the only one in charge and every inclination of humanity's heart is only wicked all the time. Yeah. Uh, the, most of the creation stories in the ancient world, because they involve a whole bunch of different gods are really violent. Mm. You know, if you're asking the question like where does the world come from it either comes from the gods killing each other or the gods sleeping around with each other and often the the physical world is like made up of kind of the mess that's mm. in the aftermath of that i mean in the epic of gilgamesh i mean not the epic of gilgamesh in the um enuma elish in the babylonian creation story the world appears to have been created by one god killing another one and making the world out of her dead carcass nice now if that's the world that you're living in yeah and then you hear this story about this one god who creates completely non-violently solely by the word of his power and not to create humans as slaves to get the gods off the hook for having to feed themselves which mm. is another common view of why yeah. the gods have created the humanity in the ancient world but as co-rulers as people with dignity uh, you know, that those would be the kind of things that I think an ancient audience would be hearing as really significant. Um, and, and so I think reading in its context is really important. Or, or another one, just one more, if you'll allow. Yeah. Um, John Walton has made the point that like the only place that we ever hear of God's resting is in a temple, right? So that makes when you hear and God rested on the seventh day, not like, oh, God took a nap, yeah. but like God is if the only place God's rest is in the temple, if everybody knows that, then you're an ancient Israelite, you hear on the seventh day God rested. Well, now you recognize that this orderly construction of the universe is not just an orderly construction of the world. It's the creation of heaven and earth, everything as a cosmic temple in which God wants to dwell. That has enormous implications for how we think about the world. What's the world like? It's God's temple in which he longs to dwell which turns out to be really important for the whole story, right? Because God's intention is that the dwelling of God would be, will be with humanity and he will be their God and they'll be his people. That's, that's a theme that shows up with Israel all the way through to the end of the book of revelation. And as it turns out, it starts right there in Genesis, if you know what to listen for. Sure. And certainly the people who heard these stories first knew what to listen for. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, 
the two things that you struck me in, in terms of that saying that is one is that God is, is not kind of capricious or yeah, whimsical, but really faithful and consistent, but also yes. good. But then also that the idea of, you know, in a, a potential parallel is that in our day, we're struggling with our own identity about what we think about ourselves and where we come from, whatever. And they would have been as well, but with a very different idea of like, are we just little rugrats that these gods have kind of like spit out? Um, yes. Where we actually valued people, um, where we're created for a good reason to be in this place by a God who longs to be with us. Yes. And a lot of scholars think that in most of the other creation stories, what you get is that God kind of creates a state when he creates the world. Mm. So what you also get in terms of human identity is that where you fit on the social hierarchy is written into the fabric of the universe. Okay. So it's really unusual that all of you, all men would be made in the image of God. And it's completely unexpected that men and women would be made in the image of God. Like that's completely countercultural in ancient Near East. If somebody was going to be the image of God, it would be a male king or male priest. To say men and women are all made in God's image is completely radical. And it's this huge message, right, mm. that the Bible is making and that the Bible will unpack from Genesis to Revelation. And this is honestly my real concern. Like, again, you know, how did God create the world? I mean, these are enormous questions. And if we believe that God created the world out of nothing, which I do, he may have done it any way he liked, including yeah. in several. I mean, this could be, you know, that that may well be and and fine. But but what I worry about when we get make that the point is that we miss what the tra- the text is trying to say to us, sure. which are claims about what is the world like. It's mm. it's it is it is good. It is created peacefully solely by the word of God's power. It's created as a place for him to dwell, you know, mm. and it's, cre- and, and we are sort of equally people who like Kings and priests reflect God's character in the world. Another example is like in the ancient world, often the sea is the place of chaos yeah. and trouble. And again, to get the Babylonian story, you know, the God, if you're in Babylon, the God that we worship got to be the God that we worship by defeating the sea and the sea goddess had monsters on her team. And if you read closely in the Genesis one account, uh, it says, uh, and, and the God created the fish of the sea and the great sea creatures, the NRSV actually says the sea monsters, which is, which is right. Because part of what Genesis is saying is whatever's out there, all that scary stuff out there. And if you watch Blue Planet, you know, the BBC documentary, yeah. you know, yeah. there's some scary stuff down there. The ancients were right about that. But but God is saying, making the strong claim, whatever is out there yeah. uh, is my good creation. Mm. And that's why in Job, you know, you get God talking about the sea monster like Leviathan and Behemoth and saying, yeah. I'm not afraid of those things. I don't have to defeat those creatures. I love those those chaotic crazy creatures down in the heart of the sea so so i really think that when we get what scripture's trying to do in these these texts it's like really remarkable you Mm. know it's exciting another example would be that genesis 10 and 11 why does genesis seem to say he may spread out and they create all these languages and then go back and tell us about the tower of babel i think it's because the original command to fill the earth builds uh ethnic and cultural diversity into god's design yeah. and that's how the world is presented to us in genesis 10 is mm. that people spreading out forming tribes developing with yeah. the land mm-hmm. different cultures different languages that's all good because it yeah. is good and because yeah. god likes it and by putting the tower of babel after that story it makes it clear that this kind of false homogenizing is a problem Mm. But it makes it also clear that God diversifying their languages does not make cultural diversity punishment. If you just had the Tower of Babel, it sure. would make it seem as if language diversity and thus cultural diversity was just punishment. But the order of the text makes it clear that, no, that diversity is a good thing. Now let's look at some problems and you get this Tower of Babel story. So yeah. all the way along, the text is really making these huge, important claims on us. Um, that strike at the very heart of who we are and what God's up to and what the world's like. It tells us what the world is like, really yeah. and truly, but but maybe not answering the questions that, that are most natural to us. 
but I think also too, uh, with a, a narrative or like a writing literary style and structure and, and kind of parameters are perhaps broader than ours, or if you want to say it like, if you want to say we've got literary parameters for us or like this, they kind of take half of ours and half of their own. And they have different ways of writing than we do. And we're like, wait, that's not the way that you should write it. We're like, let's, this is the way we did it. We don't really yeah, care what yeah. you think. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah and, and part of that is because from the very beginning, God is, um, I mean, uh, we know that when God becomes human in Jesus, that's the incarnation, right? Yeah. And that means that God like literally accommodates himself to these first yeah. century Jews. Mm. And in a different but analogous way, scripture's working that way all along. God is coming down to speak to them in the language that they can understand, right? Yeah. Like if God wanted to tell us that the world is a temple for him to dwell in uh him telling us that he rested on the seventh day would not be the way to communicate that to us necessarily yeah but apparently scholars tell us it certainly was the way to communicate it to them yeah and and that's while it makes it hard it makes scripture harder for us to grapple with in some ways yeah. it's also really hopeful because it means that god is committed to speaking to people in times and places in the language they can hear yeah. And if that's hard news for us, the good yeah. news is it, it was good news for them. Yeah. And it's connected to the good news that God still speaks to us today yeah. uh, in Jesus by the spirit and through his word. Yeah. Yeah. Which are things that we've, yeah, we've tried to at least wrestle with before we've gotten to Genesis is remind ourselves that, that God is able to communicate in all different ways to us. Mm. It is constantly speaking. Um, yeah. Which is, is so encouraging. Um, so just, yeah, just to wrap up here. Uh, so, you read this and we realize that Genesis 1 through 11 is different, different kind of literature, different kind of story, and yet getting after the deep realities of life. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Genesis 12 and Abraham, and it seems like the story shifts from being yeah. this kind of prehistory or proto-history or however you want to describe it to this. Um, is, there, is there a problem in connecting those two things or do you feel like? No, I think, I think that the key to holding Genesis together is recognizing that Israel, Abraham's family, is the com is is the community which stands in for Adam and Eve where they failed. So if Genesis one and two gives us this like grand vision for all of humanity's purposes, mm. what is God doing with people? He is ruling and reigning His good world through His image bearers with whom He dwells in creation. And Adam and Eve screw that up and all the other people that God works with screw it up. Right. And so by the time you get to 12, then we find out that God's strategy, God's plan is that he is going to get his project back on track by working very intensively with this family of Abraham's family, which will become the people of Israel who will sort of on the one hand um, are, are to be everything that Adam and Eve were to be, right? If, if, if Adam and Eve, if, the, if human, humanity were supposed to be kingdom and priests, sure. then Israel will be a kingdom of priests. Sure. If yeah. Adam and Eve being made in the image of God means be, having a childlike relationship with God, mm. Israel will be God's firstborn son. It, so in some ways, Abraham's family will sort of inherit the promises of Adam and Eve, and yeah. yet of all, all humanity. And yet, crucially, the promise is that through this family, God will bless, bless all the families of the earth, which is how Jesus works. Yeah. Right? He is the Israelite, mm. the one through whom God brings blessing to the many. Right. So, so Genesis 1 through 11 gives this. It, it sets up the huge vision that God has for humanity and the deep problems that, that humanity has in mm. participating in God's mission. Yeah. And then Genesis 12 sets us up for the rest of the old Testament to say the way that God is going to remain committed to humanity is through his work with this one family. Mm. And I wish I had like three and a half hours to talk about how all of that works out, you know, cause I mean, it's the most exciting, it's the most exciting thing going. Um, but it's crucial because uh, God's plan A uh, is to bring blessing, his blessed presence into creation through his image bearers. And the way he stays committed to that is by bringing blessing to all of creation and all of humanity through this one family, mm -hmm. which we all of a sudden meet 
yeah. and this childless, unexpected nobody named Abram in Genesis 12. So this it all holds together. It all holds together sure. and it has to be held together if the whole thing is going to make any sense. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting, yeah, you just you say that, that there's a continuous effort of God to keep working through people even though they fail over and over and over again, is that he's moving that same plan, that same idea all the way through. Uh, yes. Until Jesus. And then even through Jesus, he does it through us. When we fail, he still is faithful to us. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, you know, you can, uh, Christians have often told the story, like God tries with Adam, that doesn't work. So God tries to know that and we're going to try with Abraham, that didn't work. Israel fails. So God kind of, Jesus comes and lets us all off the hook. That's a complete misreading of the story where where the people of god are faithless god comes as the faithful one mm. to reestablish his people as faithful so yeah. jesus's mission is to fulfill the promise of creation to fulfill the promise to abraham to fulfill the promise of the old testament that he would dwell with a people mm. who because he dwells with them reflect his character in the world for the good of the world so yes. Again, like once we get what God's doing with Abraham and Israel, we can more fully understand what God's doing in Jesus and what God wants to do with us, which is to so dwell with us that we reflect his character in the world as his image bearers mm. for the sake of creation and for the sake of the nations to draw them to a relationship with Jesus. And so, yeah, the whole story holds together right out of the gate you know right well and yeah you learn this through through genesis 1 through 11 which is kind of like the big picture reality of it all and then it gets squeezed down to abraham and then kind of filters back out and back in and yes and you, if you don't have genesis 1 through 11 you don't really have the, the introduction that kind of sets all the pieces up for you yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah it, it so much of the old testament is focused on israel and so without Genesis 1 through 11, it would not be clear as clear as it is mm. how God's purposes for Abraham and Israel are cosmic. They are his purposes for the world. Right. God chooses Abraham for the sake of the nations, mm. you know, and we would lose that clarity. It, it wouldn't disappear, but it would be harder to see if we didn't have this Genesis 1 through 11 that sets the whole thing in this kind of cosmic context. All right. Well, that's extremely helpful. So last thing, if you can do this like in a minute, this is an unfair question, but um, so what impact do you think that Genesis 1 through 11 should have on our kind of personal faith as we try to live Jesus out and as we interact with the modern world? So yeah. <laughs> That's a dirty question. I mean, I, 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 hopefully I've already given some hints of this. I mean, I think the goodness of the created world and the fact that the world, you know, okay, you want to talk about science, right? Mm. I do think that materialistic, any materialistic worldview has to eventually see the world as a place of intrinsic violence and competition. Like yeah. eventually that's what you get to. And what we believe is that the world as it was designed works because it's good and, mm. and because God wants it to, and he created it that way. And the brokenness that exists is to some extent connected with us. So there's intrinsic important messages about the human heart and the human yep. condition. Um, and, but also human dignity that people, male and female are made equally in the image of God and given this royal priestly familial task is hugely important and mm -hmm. that god's purposes for the world include flourishing and blessing and diversifying and filling um and cultivating the world around us so i mean i think there's so many important truth claims there and it explains um if the world wasn't as good as genesis 1 tells us it is then Jesus' salvation would be about getting us out of the world. Yeah. But Jesus' salvation is not about getting us out of the world. Jesus' salvation is about coming into the world, becoming a part of the world in the incarnation, and one day uh, resurrecting us and bringing new, restored, renovated creation, yeah. all because his creation is good out of the gate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And is a project that he wants to bring to fulfillment mm -hmm. through his people. So I think... Um, I mean, 
hopefully those are a few points that you yeah. can spend a lot of time, you know, and, yeah. and to say nothing about the propensities to violence and, yeah. and uh, 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 oppressive forms of ownership. I mean, there's so much stuff in Genesis 1 through 11 that really resonates with where we are yeah. and makes strong claims about the kind of God we worship and the kind of world we live in and the kind of people that we're called to be. Yeah, that's no, really helpful. No, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate that. And if there's any questions that the church asks, I'll make sure I send them to you because um, we'll see if I can, if I can't answer them, I'll pass them on. Well, I'm, I am thrilled to be with you all and thank you for giving me the opportunity and hope soon to be in New Zealand and come visit and also would like really encourage people to check out some of the options and courses and whatnot, both degree oriented and otherwise at Carrie, where we're talking about all these things all the time. So yeah, great. Uh, thanks for giving me the chance to be with you guys. Oh, thank you so much.